verse of Matins from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662. So let us begin. We'll worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The night is far spent, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armour of light. Dearly beloved brethren, the scriptures moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most cheap, cheaply so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice, to the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And, and there therefore there is no help in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Mighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of the sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and have given power and commandment this minister to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. And through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. 
so we will listen to our first hymn. The first reading today is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, said the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive them their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
The Gospel is taken from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now, my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came down from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. that God is with us now. There is no place where God is not. Wherever we go, God is with us. Now and always, he encompasses us, looks upon us with his mercy, and is ready to hear us when we call. Therefore, let us pray. We pray for the churches here in our parish, our diocese, and throughout the world. We ask that you will be with our bishops, Andrew and Joe, and Liz, and Liz, our minister, and all who serve in the service of your church. Thank you, Lord, for our local church, for those who have worshipped it over the years, and for those who serve it today. Grant that all who enter its doors may be able to renew their relationship with you and find your peace, your strength, and your grace, and above all, your presence. Help us as we, as a congregation, to be outward looking, so that what we find within our fellowship, we may share with those outside, for the benefit of all. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless and guide Elizabeth, our Queen, and all the members of the government of this, our land. And as we pray for them, we bring to you all the rulers of this, our trouble-torn world. Lord of the nations and friend of the poor, strengthen in the leaders of today's world belief in human dignity and for basic human rights and a belief in the values of justice, freedom and peace, in love and generosity, on reason rather than force, so nations may grow in mutual respect and understanding and recognize that the problems of the world poverty is the concern and response of them all. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all the love and happiness we share with them, and for the help and concern they give us when we are in trouble. We pray for those who are old and lonely, those isolated because of ill health, and those who find it difficult to make friends. Show us what we can do to help, and teach us to be good neighbors for Jesus Christ's sake. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We bring to you, O loving Savior, all those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, and in moments of silence, remember all those known to us, and to all the only unknown who have only us to pray for them. All healing is with you. We can only bring them to you and offer our minds in love, tenderness, and sincerity. Grant them healing, if that may be, but above all, grant them your, pres your peace and pray that they may know you are with them always. They are safe and nothing can snatch them from your hands or finally defeat their for his purposes. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray today for all the doctors, nurses, and helpers at the, vacation, at the vaccination centers who are working ceaselessly with the vaccinations of, to us all and for the success it is bringing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And remembering all those who have died in the faith of Christ, we leave, and those whose faith is only known to you, we leave them in your loving hands and care, and may light perpetual shine upon them. We ask that you will be with those who mourn, and may your loving arms surround and comfort them in their sorrow, and bring them peace. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God, you are the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is rigorous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll do the collect of the day now instead of after the sermon. So the collect for today, the fifth Sunday of Lent. 
Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Wow, it's just so lovely to be back here with you all. I've missed you all so much. I miss being together. Um, and let's hope we never have to be separated again. <laughs> and it seems rather appropriate, actually, as we begin meeting in church for worship today, that this coming Tuesday marks the start of lockdown last year. And... Um, we're told it's to be a national day of reflection. <coughs> Thankfully, instead of closing our doors altogether, as we were instructed to this time last year, we're now very much open for services in church. And no better time to reopen on this particular Sunday, known as Passion Sunday, as we prepare ourselves for Palm Sunday and Holy Week. Then. After Good Friday, once again, we can rejoice on Easter Sunday that Christ rose from the grave, light our Easter candles once more, and eat chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> One of the very positive things to have come out of this latest lockdown, I think, has been the opportunity given to us by our diocesan bishops, Bishop Andrew and Bishop Joe, to hear their speaking to us through their weekly preaching. It has allowed us all to get to know them a bit. And in Bishop Andrew's sermon for today, he shared this interesting historical fact. There was a Roman ambassador known as Pliny the Younger, who was sent by the Roman Emperor Trajan to the province of Bithynia, which is in modern day Turkey. And it seemed that wherever Pliny went, he kept bumping into Christians. And so in the year 112 AD, Pliny the Younger wrote to the emperor to ask for his advice. And this letter amazingly has survived to this day. And it says this, that the Christians that he'd come across, he writes, maintained that they met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternately among themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God. After the ceremony, it had been their custom to disperse and reassemble later to eat together. But they had, in fact, given up this practice since my edict, which banned all political societies. This made me decide that it was necessary to extract the truth by torture from two slave women whom they called deaconesses. I found nothing but a degenerate sort of cult carried to extravagant lengths. This matter seems to me worth deliberation, Pliny continued, especially on account of the number of those in danger. A great many individuals of every age and class, both men and women, are being brought to trial, and this is likely to continue. It is not only the towns, but villages and country dist districts too, which are infected through contact with this wretched cult. And so he goes on. Well, Pliny was no friend of the Christians, that's for sure. And we know how the Romans felt about those who followed what they called the way. But I just love this account about how the early church was encountered by, by Pliny. It gives us a wonderful view, doesn't it, of how they met and what they did. The chanting of verses alternately is not dissimilar to what we do today what some of us do when we meet twice a week for the daily office. Yet what a threat it must have seemed to the Romans. Women made deaconesses when women generally had no rights and were the lowest status in Roman society. Surprising too, says Bishop Andrew, that this Christian missionary movement, which he describes as the first global non-violent movement in human history, came from Israel a nation far more concerned about its own purity than about blessing the Gentiles. 
yet far more than any of this, what stands out here in this letter is the sheer variety and numbers of those who are being drawn into the life of the local church as it was then. Men and women from all ages, class, from rural and urban areas were all coming together to worship their God. Well, in today's readings, we get a glimpse of this future as some Greek worshippers asked to see Jesus. The context here in John's Gospel is the beginning of the biggest event in the Jewish calendar, the Passover. Jerusalem, usually a busy city, is now full to bursting with pilgrims and travellers who have come to this famous Jewish festival. And among these, there are some Greeks who are obviously attracted to Israel's God and are keen to meet Jesus. Well, Andrew and Philip follow up on this request, but they don't exactly get a straight yes or no answer from Jesus. In fact, they probably get more than they bargain for. Jesus begins to talk about a grain of wheat falling into the ground and dying in order that something new could come from it. This request appears to prompt Jesus to decide that now at last his hour had come for him to be glorified. Throughout John's Gospel, we've heard Jesus say his hour has not yet come. But here, just after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, of course, which we'll be celebrating next week on Palm Sunday, Jesus doesn't appear to grant the Greek's request but replies with what appears to be a meditative comment about seeds and plants, about life and death, about servants and masters. A strange answer, we might think. Well, we all know how sowing seeds work. I'm currently gearing myself up for doing that. And perhaps when you were a child, you might have tried planting a conker in the garden, like the theologian Tom Wright, who did this and felt terribly sad, really, that it was, in his eyes, a waste of a perfectly good conquer. <laughs> but it did grow, you'll be pleased to hear. But he says, Jesus' death will be like sowing a seed into the ground. It will look like a tragedy, the large-scale, fully-grown version of the tiny tragedy a small child may feel at planting one of his largest and best conquers in the ground and never seeing it again. Yet it will be a triumph, the triumph of God's self-giving love, the love that looks death itself in the face and defeats it by meeting it voluntarily on behalf of not just of Israel, but of the whole world represented by those Greeks. And the talk about seeds is only the beginning of his answer. At the end of the reading, Jesus declares that when he is lifted up from the earth, he will draw all people to himself. And so then we see how it is that God will save the world through the death of Jesus. And the answer then to the Greeks' request is if they really want to see him, if they really want to benefit fully from what he's been sent into the world to do, not only does Jesus have to continue to complete the work his father has given him, but the Greeks too will have to follow in his way, not by death, but by dying to the life, the values they once held. And so Jesus realises his time has now come. Preparation has been completed and the final moment of love and liberation has to take place. The fact that foreigners are asking to see him here in Jerusalem, appears to act as a sign, like the first leaf of spring. And so what does Jesus do, having reached this point? Jesus says, my soul is troubled, deeply troubled, not surprisingly. We are told that Jesus is the word become flesh, but he is human flesh too, flesh that shrinks from suffering as we all would. And so his natural instinct is to try to maybe avoid it and in calling to God to glorify his name God's affirming voice is heard in the sound of thunder Jesus is therefore strengthened but declares that the voice that was heard was for 
his followers so that they too will be strengthened and affirmed through him. So as we journey on through the end to the end of our lockdown, hopefully on our way to freedom, we'll remember that God that does not give up on us, that love, mercy and life is stronger than the hate, judgment and death that can, it seems at times, colour our world. What the world counts as defeat, God turns into glory. As we come out of lockdown, I wonder if there's anywhere that we have seen something have to diminish or die. What sacrifices might we have had to make but that might have helped us to grow in another way? What began as that small missionary movement in the first century conquered the Roman Empire and made an extraordinary impact on the world ever since and continues to do so. How privileged are we then to be his followers today? So let us pray that he might help us to release our lives to his service so that we too may bear much fruit. Amen. Mm -hmm. table which is a sort of poster about the day of reflection and um, it's coming out of the Marie Curie Foundation really um, uh, and um, so it's sort of combined with them 
Um, and they're suggesting that we take a moment, a minute silence at 12 noon on Tuesday to show our support for the millions of people who are bereaved and take a moment to connect with someone. So maybe there's somebody who you know who's bereaved or has been or is lonely and might appreciate a call. Um, I'd like the church to be open, um, Helen, wherever you are, if possible, on that day. Um, and I think they're suggesting that we tie a yellow ribbon, um, like the Marie Curie colours, outside somewhere maybe. So I don't know, Shirley, if that <laughs> might be something you could think about. Um, I will do a little, um, a little sheet of suitable prayer so if anyone wants to come, come in and want something to look at as well, um, they can. So it's really to remember those who've died. Um, then I think they're suggesting that at 8 o'clock in the evening you light a candle in your window. So I expect you'll see lots more about it. It's come to, to our notice as clergy rather late on in the day. Otherwise, I think we could have you know, maybe done a little bit more about it. But um, anyway, I think it, it should be a very nice occasion. Um, also, can you remember, if, if possible, to sign up on the sheet at the back to for Easter Day. That's the service when we, you know, feel that we've got to just make sure we're not going to be overburdened with numbers. Um, strange problem to have, isn't it? But it's so lovely to see so many of you here today. So, the blessing. May God establish in you the joy of God's covenant. Write God's laws on your heart and bring you to eternal salvation in Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and evermore. Amen. Amen.